Hi friends, this is Terry Squires with today's Nashville This Is Faith. I sat down with Governor Mike Huckabee and he shared how his broken finger as a child led him to his career today. You can stand through any trial if you're standing with God. Previous presidential candidate, host of the TV show Huckabee, Mike Huckabee is also a Fox News contributor, a New York Times bestselling author of 12 books, and a frequent speaker for corporate civic and nonprofit groups all over the world. He was the 44th governor of Arkansas from 1996 until 2007, becoming one of the longest serving governors in the state's history. He ran in 2008 and 2016 for president of the United States, finishing second in the Republican primary in 2008. His love for our country and God is unwavering. This is his story. This is Today's Nashville. This is Faith. Governor Huckabee, what a blessing and honor to have you on Today's Nashville. This is Faith. I have been wanting to have you on my show forever. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to get to visit with you, and I'm looking forward to it. You know, I went back and started looking at your history. Pastor, Lieutenant Governor, Governor of Arkansas, presidential candidate, not once, but twice, Fox contributor, television host, <laughs> husband, <laughs> father, and uh, fur baby daddy. Yes, indeed. And grandfather. All of the above. It, it, you look at that resume and you think, this guy just couldn't keep a job. You know, <laughs> what a job jumper. I've been all over the place. But it's been a, a great life. You know, I feel like God has given me uh, a life that is truly an American dream, and I, I've enjoyed it. And every stage of my life and career have been chapters that I can see God's hand in developing, opening, and then closing and opening something different. Well, I want to take you back from the very beginning to Arkansas. Can you share what it was like growing up, your family, your parents? I grew up in a little town called Hope, Arkansas that no I one had ever heard name. of. I love the name. I love the name Hope. It's a great town, and it was like Mayberry. No one locked their doors. Everybody knew everyone. It was a small town. You know, born in the mid-50s at a time when America was sort of optimistic and everybody was thinking that things are good, and, and they were. Uh, I grew up in a family that, uh, you know, just working class. And, uh, you know, we were poor, but we didn't think we were that poor because so many other people were too. But, you know, I'm the first male in my entire family lineage to ever graduate high school. My father, grandfather, great-grand, not a single male upstream for me had ever gotten out of high school. So I did not grow up with this thought of one day he'll go to Harvard. You know, if I got out of high school, I would have done something no one else had ever done. Were you a good student? I, I was a good student. And, you know, I clowned around a lot. I'm sure that will shock people to find that out. Uh, but no, I was an excellent student. I started reading almost intently when I was in the second grade. And I would read biographies and I would particularly focus on uh, reading encyclopedias. I read the newspaper, watched the TV news as a little kid. Most kids didn't do that. So I had an interest in the world around me and what was going on in it. But it wasn't because that was something that was common to my family. My dad was a firefighter. On his days off, he was a mechanic. Uh, you know, I tell the story that my father was one of those guys, like a lot of hardworking Americans, stood on his feet on concrete floors all day, uh, came home bone tired. You know, he knew just heavy lifting and hard work, had just the grime of a hard day's work on his hands, never could scrub it off. I, I like to say we grew up, the only soap we had in our house was lava soap. 
I was in college before I found out it isn't supposed to hurt when you take a shower. Uh, but when you have lava soap, you find that, you know, it's like scrubbing off. But I grew up in a wonderful home in the sense that, you know, even though my parents didn't have a lot to give me, that forced me to have to work from the time I was just a small child. So if I wanted the baseball or BBs for my BB gun, I didn't go to my parents and say, hey, can you open your wallet and give me some money? I would take a little wagon around the neighborhood and collect, uh, we call them Coke bottles in the South. Uh, we'd turn them in for deposits and we had enough, we'd go you know, buy baseball. I caught chickens, which was the most horrible job in the world. You'd go to chicken houses at 10 o'clock at night, eight, nine-year-old kids. We were slave labor. There was no OSHA back in those days because they never would have allowed this. And we'd catch chickens all night long till six in the morning and we'd stuff them in these wooden crates and off to KFC they would go. It was a horrible job, smelly, nasty. Oh, I've been in one of those. Oh, they're just, it's, you know, but here's what it did for me. As a kid, I'd come out of those chicken houses and I'd say, what do I have to do so I don't do this for the rest of my life? Well, you got to work hard, get a good education, and treat people right. So that put me on my path to the rest of my life, and I thank God for having had such a hideous uh, job early on because it motivated me. So you went to college then? I did. Went to Washita Baptist University, a uh, private Christian college in Arkansas. Wonderful school. Huge impact on me. It was, you know, a delightful atmosphere. Academically, very challenging, but spiritually was also nurturing. And that was, for me, the perfect place to be. When did you accept Jesus? On my 10th birthday, I went to vacation Bible school at a little missionary Baptist church in Hope. And I went because my sister had gone the day before. She came home and said, you ought to go to Bible school. I said, nah, Bible school's for sissies. She said, oh, you know, they give you all the cookies you can eat and all the Kool-Aid you can drink and they play baseball on the breaks. I said, well, that sounds good. So I went the next day. Of course, I found out they didn't think I could eat more than two cookies or have more than one cup of Kool-Aid. But that day, the pastor came in and talked to us about what it was to be saved. It was a word I'd never heard before. I just, what is that? But whatever he described, I knew it hadn't happened to me. And so he said, I'm going to pray a prayer. If you'd like to pray the prayer, you can pray with me and lift your hand. Well, I wasn't going to lift my hand because I thought he'd call me out and embarrass me. But I prayed the prayer. And I was overwhelmed with the sense that God had just come into my life. I mean, I'm 10 years old. It's not like I had to confess uh, drug addiction or something of that nature. It was just that as a 10-year-old kid, it was very clear to me that God was real and that He showed up in my life. And that was, uh, you know, best birthday gift I could have ever had. Did you know that He was calling you into a, an, an amazing no. ministry? No, I figured I'd just, you know, squander my life away in Hope, Arkansas, and hope, hopefully do something a little better than catching chickens at the time. When did you know the call on your life? Well, it was probably when I was 15. Um, I started work at a radio station at the age of 14, which was the result of a broken finger at age 11, playing Little League Baseball. Uh, the quick version of the story is I was playing baseball. I was a catcher. We were a horrible team, never won a game. And a kid had a foul tip and I did something catchers intuitively know they're not supposed to do. In addition to my mitt, I put my hand out here because I wanted to make sure I caught the ball. I misjudged it. The ball took this index finger and just bent it back toward my elbow. I mean, it just shattered it. And I held it up and I said, hey, coach, I think I broke my finger. I could have been an orthopedic surgeon with diagnostic skills like that. And of course, it ended my baseball season. They told me I could go to the press box and help work on the public address system and announce the batters. Okay, free Cokes, free popcorn doing that. Hope was such a small town that the local radio station broadcast all the Little League games. Now think about how boring that must have been, but they did it. The manager of the station came and he didn't want to do it because uh, the guy that normally did it got sick. He said, kid, would you like to call a few innings? I said, sure. They passed me the mic. Innings later, he said, you're not bad. When you're 14 and can get your license, come see me. I'll give you a job. And that was the beginning of that. The beginning of the... Yep. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about going from pastoring to politics and a whole lot more. Okay. Mike, let's go back to the time you broke your finger. Okay. What, were your, what was your thoughts? 
my world had ended. This was the end of life for me. At age 11, if you're playing Little League Baseball in Hope, Arkansas, there was nothing else to do. So I really thought this was the worst thing that ever could have happened to me. And you question, God, why? I look back and what I thought was the worst thing was the best thing that ever happened to me because that led me to getting a job at age 14. That paid my way through junior high, high school, college, and grad school. I did it through broadcasting. Everywhere I went, I was able to get a job in, in radio and eventually television. So, you know, it's like the story in Genesis 50, the story of Joseph, abandoned by his brothers, sold off into slavery, left for dead. They thought he was dead, hoped he was dead. Years later, after a terrible life of mistreatment and false accusations, he's in a position now to save the entire nation of Israel. And his brothers, who then realized he's alive, thought he'll kill us all. And he says to his brothers, what you intended for harm, God used for good. That's a great reminder that things that I think are the worst things that are happening to me, be patient because sometimes our detours become our destination. And what I thought was the worst thing was the best thing that ever happened to me. Turned my life around in so many ways. I was a shy, bashful kid. Being able to get on the radio where I didn't have to face people but just a microphone, learn confidence, learn how to talk, learn how to think about timing. Everything in my life all goes back to a broken finger at age 11. Best thing that ever happened to me. A broken finger. A broken finger, which I thought was a broken life, but it wasn't. And then your broken finger <laughs> took you to pastoring a church. Yeah, first, you know, most people think my first career was pastoring. It wasn't. My first career was Christian radio. broadcasting, radio and television. And I honestly thought that was going to be my life career because as a teenager working in radio and thinking, you know, I could do uh, Christian broadcasting. So that's what I intended to do. Well, didn't you work with uh, James Robinson? James Robinson, yes. I did. I was director of communications for him. I ran an ad agency for him. When I left there, I came back to Arkansas and I created an ad agency. And I honestly thought that what I was going to do was to run an ad agency. I was ghostwriting books. I was producing television and radio commercials for people and ministries. And I intended to parlay that into eventually running for public office. And a church in Palm Bluff, Arkansas asked me to come and speak at a banquet. I did. Then they asked me to come and speak on a Sunday morning. I did. They said, would you do a Bible conference? Okay. I did that. They didn't have a pastor, so they asked me would I be interim pastor. I said, sure, I can do that. I can run my business during the week and you know, come on Sundays and do this. And after a few months, they said, well, we think we found our pastor. I said, okay, what's, when's my last Sunday? They said, well, you are going to be our pastor. I said, no, 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 I'm not going to be your pastor. I don't want to be your pastor. i got a lot of other plans. And, and they said, well, you need to pray about it. It's a dangerous thing. Ended up being their pastor for the next six years. Six years. Yeah. How did you get into politics from going from being a pastor? Well, I thought that would never happen. And even though that had been sort of a, a, a life dream since I was a child, I figured, well, once you're a pastor, nobody will ever accept you to run for public office. So I was at a church in Pine Bluff, Arkansas for six years. I did what I knew. I created the television station for the community in that, through that church, which was pretty bold and adventurous in the early 80s. And then uh, a church in Texarkana asked me to come and be their pastor. I said, only if I can do what I know best, which is media. So we started the television channel in that community for that community. Then I was elected president of the Arkansas Baptist State Convention at a very tumultuous time in the, the denomination. People said, have you ever thought about running for office? And I'm thinking, you have no idea. And so I had people starting to encourage me. And, you know, God then opened that door. I ran for office, ran for the U.S. Senate, lost the race. It was in 1992. It was the year Bill Clinton was running for president. So in Arkansas, everybody wanted to vote for the hometown guy. Um, I was running against a twice governor, three-time incumbent senator. I did better than anyone thought I would do except me. I thought I would win. Nobody else thought that. That led to um, him becoming president, the lieutenant governor becoming governor, and an open seat for lieutenant governor, special election. The party came to me and said, why don't you run? You've just finished a, you know, a, an election. You've got volunteers. You have a statewide organization. And I'm thinking, I'm exhausted. I just finished this 
bruising race, but I kind of thought I'd do it, take one for the team. Much to everyone's surprise, I ended up winning. And I beat a guy who was Bill Clinton's uh, former legal counsel, hand-picked heir apparent to the entire Democrat party. I'm a Republican. Only three Republicans had ever won statewide office in 150 years. So it was quite the victory to win, and that was the turning point for, uh, for well, what was to come. I read that story about Dick Morris. Yeah. <laughs> and the polls. Yeah. And he was sitting there working the polls, and all of a sudden he said, you've won. Yeah, this was like 10 minutes after the polls closed. And he's getting some quick results from two or three places around the state, and he's frantically figuring on this little pad of paper, and he looks up, and in his classic Dick Morris style, because he's a you know, New York guy, and he looks up and he says, well, you just won. I said, no, I didn't, Dick. I mean, you, we're barely, you know, 3% of the vote in. Yeah, you just won. You're going to win by 51 to 49. And I said, how do you know that? He said, trust me. By 10 o'clock, he was exactly right on the numbers, but he had s sampled just enough to kind of know where it was going to be. It was amazing to me that, that he could know that. But it was an extraordinary uh, upset victory that really started a lot of changes in Arkansas politics. And we were such a tiny minority. Incredible. That went from now a supermajority party in the state that my daughter is able to uh, enjoy. And I tell her sometimes, you better be glad that you have a majority and not having to deal with what I did, which included having the door to my office nailed shut on the day of my swearing in as lieutenant governor because the Democrats in the state were so angry that I had won the election. Webb Hubble, who was working at Bill Clinton's White House, called back to the Capitol and said, this is an embarrassment to the president to have this guy when you got to give him a lesson. So they nailed my door shut. It remained nailed shut for 59 days. I could not get into the door of my office. And it was physically nailed. I'm not making, this is not an apocryphal story. How did you get in then after? Well, after a period of time, a lot of people were angry. Even Democrats who didn't vote for me said, this is embarrassing. Look, we may not like the guy, but he got elected. You can't do this. And so there was enough pressure um, and I put a little sign out by the door, and every day I'd change the number. 39 days and still no office. 30, 40 days and still no office. And the press picked up on it, made a national news story. The Wall Street Journal flew John Fund down to do a story on it. And it became a source of, of humiliation for the Democrats, what sore losers they were. Still are today. <laughs> <laughs> You've done some great things for the state of Arkansas in those years. Let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. You know, one of the things that I did early on was create a program called Our Kids First. Most people don't understand, but if people are wealthy, they can afford health care for their kids. If they're poor, they have Medicaid, which is a platinum level health care plan, pays for everything. If you're working class, if you're in the middle, above the threshold of poverty, but below the threshold of wealth, and you're caught in that middle, you're the ones who pay but you can't afford for your kids simple health care. So we bridged that gap with a program called Our Kids First. It was innovative. It was a precursor to what became a federal CHIPS program, but it was our program to start with. And it was amazing the difference it made. It meant that a single mom working as a waitress who had a child with a heart defect could go to Children's Hospital and her child's life could be saved because uh, it would cover the heart surgery. It was those kind of things that, for me, are the most rewarding lookbacks of my political life. And there were, you know, many things. I, I worked on uh, education, rebuilding our state's highways, which were horrible. You know, I, I had a great time, almost 11 years as governor, because I had two and a half years filling out the term of my predecessor and then reelected twice. Best job I've ever had. Governor's a wonderful job because you can really get things done. Well, God is still using you still have a huge voice in our culture and in our world, and we're going to talk about it when we come back. Governor, when did you know that you wanted to run for President of the United States? Wow. I think it was late in my last term as governor. I'd been elected chairman of the National Governors Association, and prior to that, I'd done a lot of interstate government things. I headed the uh, Oil and Gas Commission, which is a compact of 37 states. 
I'd been the chairman of the uh, Southern Region Education Board. I'd been chairman of the Southern Governors Association, and then elected chairman of the National Governors. That was a very high profile position. You kind of are the spokesperson for the 50 governors. And uh, so I had a lot of opportunities to do national uh, issues uh, on behalf of the states. And it was during that time that, you know, I thought, well, you know, I, I don't want to just retire and go sit on some corporate board somewhere. And I really thought, uh, you know, taking some of the things that we had done at the state level, things that I'd learned from other states, and I truly, even to this day, believe that it's state government where things happen. I'm a strong Tenth Amendment guy. The, the federal government was intended by our founders to be pretty small and insignificant. The power to move things was to be in the states. And I thought we had lost that. That's what led to my decision to run for the presidency in, uh, in 2007 for the 2008 election. You know, came in second to John McCain, which a lot of people never thought I'd get that far. Didn't have anywhere near the money that the other candidates had, uh, but built a movement. And many called it a populist movement. I would say that if you wanted to see the precursor to what became the Make America Great or America First movement, go back and, and look at our campaign, what the issues were, what I was saying in 2007 and 2008, and you really see the foundation for what has now become a full-blown winning national movement. Well, we were following you. Well, thank you. Then. <laughs> and then 2016. Yeah, 2016, I, I thought, you know, maybe I have another shot at this. And of course, I was one of 18 people who were obliterated by Donald Trump and his candidacy. But I didn't mind that much because I really felt like he had the gravitas and particularly he had the momentum, the celebrity and everything else that he could take the movement and, and make it work. And what a lot of people were shocked by, you, you're supporting Donald Trump, you know, uh, as a Christian, how do you do that? I said, well, I'm not electing him to be my pastor. In fact, I introduced him in June of 2016. Uh, ben Carson and I hosted this event at the Marriott Marquis in New York. We had 1,200 pastors and Christian leaders of all the big organizations. It was sort of like the mafia family getting together. But it was to, to introduce them to Donald Trump because we had both endorsed Trump and a lot of people were scratching their heads and thinking, why? And here's how I introduced him. I'm as close as I am to you. And in front of all these people with him sitting there, I said, look, I'm not gonna pretend to you that Donald Trump is one of us. He's not. He probably won't be on the front pew of your church next Sunday or ever. And I said, I'm not sure the guy could find John 3:16 in a Mark New Testament. I said, but I know this, he believes in the government leaving us alone he believes in religious liberty. He's not going to use his power to try to tell the church and the pastors what to preach and what to do. And I said, and that's really what we want from government. And it is, and I, th I think it's not that you want the government to advance a faith, but you don't want them fighting against faith and the people who champion it. And quite frankly, there's never been a president who did more for religious liberty more to free up churches in their pulpits than Donald Trump was. So all of those things were, were a part of that. You know, I've never looked back and I never said, oh, you know, what a terrible mistake it was to run. Because from the first effort, that's what opened the door to my being a show host on Fox News and a contributor for years. National radio show took over the Paul Harvey franchise when he passed away and did that for several years. We were able to write a number of books None of that would have happened had I not run for president. So it, it's another broken finger. I know. I, I just <laughs> you were just on TV just yesterday, weren't you? Yeah. On, and uh, here you are with me today. Right? So um, when you look at the culture today, faith and politics, a lot of people have a hard time with that. How do you merge those? Well, I think people need to understand that politics is is like the NFL. It, it's a game played within these boundaries, and it's a tough game. You hit hard. It, it's not one for the, the faint of heart. Politics is a game uh, that's full contact sport played without pads. And if people go in thinking it's gonna be gentle and kind and sweet and nice, they're gonna be horribly hurt and disappointed. I don't have a problem, and it's not a compartmentalization. I'm gonna be a Christian full-time in or out of politics. But if you're a Christian and you love Jesus, 
but you're an NFL football player and you come to the line of scrimmage, you don't look over and say, I'm so sorry, but when that ball is snapped, I might bump into you just a little bit. No, you're going to go full speed. You're going to try to put that person on his or her back and you're going to go after the quarterback and try to take the ball away from him. That's the game. So people who are Christians have to understand that within the context of politics, you know, it's about winning the votes and then it's about winning the issues and getting the legislation that will cause your policies to be enacted. I, I don't see the conflict because I've been able to live comfortably in both those worlds, but a lot of people think that you play by Sunday school rules in Congress or in the State House. I think you are always act ethically, you act morally, hopefully you do, and that you maintain your Christian witness and, and your identity, but it doesn't mean that you are not going to, uh, to play to win. Well, what do you think about everything that's going on today? We've had a lot go on. I, I think the big battle we see is not political, and I try to tell people. Everyone says this is Democrats, Republicans, left, right, conservative, liberal. No, it's not. This is a spiritual battle. And if we don't see it that way, we'll never understand it. This is a battle between, is there a God? Did he make the rules for us? Or is there not a God and we just create one because it makes us feel better? That's really the battle. And if I believe there is a God, that he sent his son Jesus to show us what life is, and this God is real, He's involved in our lives, He's set the rules, I better play by those rules. If I don't play by the rules that were created by the founder of the game, I can't win. So if, if it's an issue of human sexuality, what marriage looks like, whether there are two genders or 117, I've got to ask myself, by whose rules am I going to play? By the rules of God as established in His Word, the Bible? Or am I going to play by rules of people who decided to change the culture into their image rather than to change the culture into the image that God has laid down. How are we going to play? Are we going to uh, force God into our uh, understanding? Or are we going to put ourselves into His understanding? That's a spiritual battle. That's where we are in our culture today. It's not a political battle. It truly is truly a spiritual agree. battle. You hear that, the words, my truth. Yeah. No. No such it's, thing. No. No. It's His truth. His truth. Absolutely. Governor, thank you so much for being with me today. Terry, it has been a delight. I've thank been you. I've wanting you for a long time Well, on thank the show. you. I'm, I'm glad I got to show up. Thank you very thank much. You. My friend, are you struggling to know the truth, your truth or God's truth? Trust Him today. He will open your eyes. This is today's Nashville. This is faith.